Joe Biden continues to push Build Back Better while Democratic hopes go sour in Virginia. The White House tells Americans they can also live the government-dependent life of Linda. And the government prepares to pay illegal immigrant families separated at the border huge dollars. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. You have a right to privacy. Defend your rights at expressvpn.com. Slash Ben. Here is your reminder. You are spending way too much money on your cell phone bill right now. You think you need one of the big providers like Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile because they have all the best cell towers. But here's the thing. What if you could have access to all of those cell towers without any of the extra costs associated with their massive marketing campaigns or the stores that you never visit? This is what Pure Talk does for you. Pure Talk isn't going to charge you for any of that stuff. Instead, they give you killer 5G coverage on the same 5G network as one of the big guys for about half the cost. The average family is saving over $800 a year. So what exactly is your excuse? I made the switch. You can keep your number, keep your phone, or get huge discounts on the latest iPhones and Androids. Get unlimited talk, text, and six gigs of data for just 30 bucks a month. And if you still want unlimited data, you can still get it and save a fortune. Go to puretalk.com, shop for the plan that is right for you. They have a 30-day risk-free guarantee, so you literally have nothing to lose. Go to puretalk.com, enter promo code Shapiro. You will save 50% off your very first month of coverage. That's puretalk.com, promo code Shapiro. Pure Talk is simply smarter wireless. There's no reason for you to be spending a fortune above and beyond what you have to spend for your cell phone provider coverage. This is why Pure Talk is just way better than Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile. Go check out Pure Talk today at puretalk.com, promo code Shapiro to save 50% off your very first month. Of coverage. Okay, so before we get to the latest in the Build Back Better drama and whether Joe Biden is going to be able to cram through this $1.75 trillion boondoggle, which actually is not $1.75 trillion, it's actually closer to $3 trillion, as we will discuss, it is important to mention that everything right now in terms of the Democratic hopes relies on Glenn Youngkin not winning in Virginia. So this Virginia gubernatorial race has now become one of the great shockers in modern American political history. The polling shows Glenn Youngkin up. There are two separate polls out yesterday showing Glenn Youngkin up substantially on Terry McAuliffe. Remember, this is a state that Joe Biden won just a few months back by 10 points. Okay, this, this state has now shifted dramatically against the party of the president of the United States. According to a brand new poll provided to the Washington Examiner, Youngkin is now at 47 and McAuliffe is at 43. Okay, and that's not the only poll that is like this. There's another poll that is out from Fox News. Fox News historically has been a very pro-McAuliffe poll. The new poll shows Youngkin up eight points on McAuliffe, 53 to 45. He leads among, Youngkin leads among registered voters by one point and likely voters by eight. Youngkin is at plus 14 with parents, plus 11 on the economy, plus eight on education, plus 12 on crime, and even plus one on COVID. Okay, we are only a few days out from the election. Now, this is not the first time that something like this has happened. Actually, Bob McDonald, when he won, election in Virginia. That had been right after a Democratic sweep. And then he won election in Virginia by like a wide margin. He shifted from a plus six Democratic state to like a plus 17 state for Bob McDonald. So Virginia does have a habit of backlashing against radicalism. And that's what you are seeing right here. And Democrats have to be running a little bit scared because McAuliffe has run on the Biden agenda and by yelling Trump a lot. And it's not working. And the Biden agenda is really unpopular. Bringing in Joe Biden to try and save the day had apparently no impact. Americans are still concerned with the radicalism of critical race theory. They are still concerned with whether they get to control their kids' education. They're still concerned with inflation. They're concerned with all of the issues Democrats would prefer they not care about. And the Democratic solution for all these problems is to continue to throw money at it. Well, if Glenn Youngkin upsets Terry McAuliffe, who, remember, is a revered figure inside the Democratic Party. He's a former governor of Virginia. He's the former head of the DNC. He's a Hillary Clinton acolyte. If Terry McAuliffe goes down to flaming defeat in Virginia, there are going to be a lot of Congress people, blue dog Democrats, if they still exist, Some of the senators are going to say, "Um, I don't really want to reap the whirlwind in order to push through a bill that is just loaded with pork for Joe Biden's friends. It does not seem like a good deal. Okay, so this is why Joe Biden is trying to push this through. He needs to ram this through. So yesterday, Joe Biden tried to ram this thing through the, the infrastructure bill at the very least. So his basic idea was divide up the infrastructure bill and build back better. Why? Well, if you can get the infrastructure bill passed, then there will be no leverage for the progressive caucus on the build back better plan because they'll either have to vote it up or vote it down, but they'll be voting it up or down in the absence of any piece of leverage. If they vote against the bill, then the bill just goes down to defeat. They don't get any win out of it. It just looks like spite. If, however, they hold up the infrastructure plan in order to get people to put more pork into the Build Back Better plan, then they have a little bit of leverage. So 
Joe Biden was really pushing yesterday for an infrastructure plan vote. He wanted that vote yesterday. He put out a framework for Build Back Better. He hoped that this would get the Congressional Progressive Caucus on board to vote for the infrastructure plan. And then he could separate off Build Back Better and then he wouldn't have to worry about the progressives. He could just go ahead and push forward his moderate plan, get enough votes on the Democratic side of the aisle to do it. And the progressives would probably join in because it's better for them to vote, to, to vote up or down on Build Back Better and vote in favor than not to vote for it at all. Right, the leverage game is over if there is a vote on the infrastructure plan. So late last night, Joe Biden was pushing very hard for there to be a, a vote. Nancy Pelosi was pushing hard for there to be a vote. This is the second straight week Nancy Pelosi has said they wanted to vote on infrastructure. And this is the second straight week that it simply didn't happen. So if this extends, if this discussion extends all the way past the election next week, which is happening on November 2nd, if that election ends up going in Glenn Youngkin's favor, I think it's gonna be very difficult for Democrats to pass anything that looks remotely like even what they're discussing right now, because none of the details have been worked out. Maybe they get an infrastructure plan, but it's hard to imagine that Manchin, who's in the state next door to Len Youngkin, and Cinema, who's going to be running a competitive race next time, she didn't win by very much last time, that both of them are going to be deeply interested in voting for Build Back Better. So remember that Cinema and Manchin are actually just shielding a couple of other Democrats in the Senate who are really in tight races right now. So Maggie Hassan in New Hampshire, for example, is not guaranteed a reelect in her race. Sununu might run in that race. If he runs, she's in real trouble. So if she votes for Build Back Better and votes for tax increases in a state that is a very low tax state, New Hampshire, it doesn't like taxes very much, she could easily lose that seat. So that's another senator who is going to be on the firing line if Youngkin wins in Virginia. Mark Kelly is in Arizona. And he ran a very competitive race last time. There's no reason why he wouldn't be highly vulnerable if this bill passes with his vote and it passes on a straight party line vote, 50-50. So what happens in Virginia matters an awful lot, which is why Joe Biden is trying to force this thing through fast. What's amazing is that he's, he's trying to force this thing through in the face of overwhelming evidence that the American people are not interested. His approval ratings are down in the low 40s. And the harder he pushes his plan, the lower his approval ratings go. Plus, the U.S. economy in Q3 just died. It just laid down and died. It laid an egg. According to the Washington Post, the U.S. economy grew at a disappointing 2.0% annual rate in the third quarter as the Delta variant peaked. But promising signs suggest 2021 is on track to notch the fastest full year growth in almost four decades. I love how the Washington Post has to try and salvage Joe Biden from himself. So right now, you should not be having quarterly growth of 2%. You should, have be, a, you should be having quarterly annualized growth of 7 or 8%. It is what was forecast all year long. Yes, there's going to be a fast growth year overall because we had the worst year in terms of GDP growth in modern American history last year because of the artificial shutdown of the entire economy, thanks to COVID. But Joe Biden's policies have now crimped an economy that should have been racing ahead at full speed because he has pushed inflationary policy, because he has pushed bad tax policy, because he has made people unlikely to invest. And even if you are investing, you can't even get workers out there. He's paying people to stay home. Build Back Better does that too. And Joe Biden's answer, as always, is more cowbell. So they've put, they've got a real pickle on their hands. They're kind of stuck here. If they push Bill Back Better and it passes, they might lose the Senate. And if they don't pass Bill Back Better, then it looks like Joe Biden is incompetent and he can't get his party together. Now, both of those things can be true. But if either one of them is true, he's got a real problem come 2022. The notion that this $1.75 trillion budget plan is suddenly going to jog the economy is totally crazy. It's not going to jog the economy. It's simply going to be pushing more money into an economy that's already inflating. And Joe Biden is not making a convincing case for his own agenda. So yesterday, he was making the case for Bill Back Better again. He's on the stump. And as I say, Joe Biden on the stump is basically just two tree stumps on top of each other because Joe Biden is himself a stump. So it's a stump atop another stump. So Joe Biden from the White House yesterday was trying to push forward his Build Back Better plan. He put forward in a, a, a framework, okay, not the actual plan. So when people say they'll vote for it or vote against it, it doesn't mean anything until we actually have all of the details. But he put together a framework and he basically said, I'm skipping town tomorrow, right? Because today he's headed over to Europe to jabber with the Europeans about global warming or some such and hang out with the Pope in a non-televised event. And, and Joe Biden, he, he says, I'm going to dump this framework out there and then I'm going to pretend like we've achieved some sort of grand progress here. Here he was yesterday trying to push Bill back better. And of course, he is not an inspiring figure, folks. This framework includes historic investments in our nation and in our people. Any single element of this framework would fundamentally viewed, would view, be viewed as a fundamental change in America. Taken together, they're truly consequential. Okay, inspiring stuff. The words of a, of a, 
of a charismatic leader there from Joe Biden. I'm sure he's going to start convincing people. Maybe if he yells at us, maybe he just randomly yells in the middle of sentences, that'll do it. We used to lead the world in educational achievement. Now the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development ranks America 35th out of the 37 major countries when it comes to investing in early childhood education and care. We know how our children start impacts significantly on how they'll finish. He's very angry at you. I don't know why he's angry at you. You didn't do it. Also, Head Start, as we will discuss in a little bit, which is kind of a big part of this program. They're basically trying to universalize Head Start. Head Start's a giant fail. It's a giant waste of money. Okay, and then you might think, okay, well, you have some questions for this guy because after all, he's willing to stand there and take blow after blow on behalf of his plans. Uh, nope, he is, uh, he's going to run away. He's brave Sir Robin running away. Here we go, as always. Thank you. Catch you later. Bye-bye. And there's Joe stumbling out of the room on his way to Europe. What an inspiring figure. Amazing stuff. Okay, so again, Joe Biden's plan as of yesterday was let's get the infrastructure vote done. So he throws out the framework, hoping that the congressional progressives will endorse the framework and feel so comfortable that they then vote on the infrastructure plan, which takes away all their leverage on the framework. Well, wrong he was. According to Politico, the House voted Thursday night to temporarily reauthorize transportation funding, abruptly reversing course after Democratic leaders earlier vowed to pass a bipartisan Senate-approved infrastructure bill. The move came after progressives refused to relent in their opposition to the $550 billion infrastructure bill amid a standoff over Democrats' separate party-line $1.75 trillion social spending measure. It followed a visit to Capitol Hill by President Biden, who personally asked House Democrats for their support on both of them. Nope. Nope. Speaker Nancy Pelosi and her leadership team were ultimately unable to win over dozens of dug-in liberals in time for a Thursday evening vote. Instead, they're now breaking for the weekend. House liberals said they want to review the legislative text of the $1.75 trillion social spending legislation the White House outlined on Thursday. It's like 1,600 pages of garbage. And get a commitment of support from centrist senators Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, something the two have not given outright at this point. And again, Cinema and Manchin, when I say that they are really on razor's edge here, if Youngkin wins in Virginia, they have got to be looking at their political futures and saying, if I vote for this thing, what exactly do I get? Despite an aggressive whipping campaign from Democratic leaders, as many as 30 liberal Democrats threatened to block the roughly $550 billion Senate-passed infrastructure bill, according to multiple people familiar with the vote tallying operation. As House Democrats headed home for the weekend in defeat, many were infuriated and left wondering how they had stumbled yet again, pointing fingers within their own party. Congressional Progressive Caucus Chair Re Representative Pramila Jayapal, she said, I tried to tell anybody who had listened that we didn't have the votes. She then added, we want assurances that Build Back Better is going to pass in the Senate before we commit to actually passing the infrastructure vote. Here's Representative Pramila Jayapal, who on the left is running things for the Democratic Party. We need to see both votes on the, on the Build Back Better Act and the infrastructure bill moving forward together. Um, we also want to see uh, the commitment from the two senators and, and frankly, all 50 senators that they are also supportive of this framework and that it will be passed with no undermining in the Senate. OK, so again, the progressives are not going to give up their leverage. They've dug their teeth in. And Biden and Pelosi really can't do much about that at all, other than trying to get the progressives on board for actual build back better. Again, the more time that passes, the worse this gets for the Democrats. Remember, we are now at the end of October. By next week, we'll be into November. At the beginning of December, the Democrats face the debt ceiling again. So if they don't actually have a deal by the time they hit December, Republicans are not extending that debt ceiling again. It's going to have to be done solely with the, the reconciliation process via solely Democratic votes. So Democrats are in trouble here. And even if they pass this, they are in trouble. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, if you're like me, you probably want to make sure that you have a diversified portfolio. But here is the thing. Bond yields right now are flatter than the state of Florida. You can only buy so much gold and savings account are not even keeping up with inflation. If you don't act, inflation could turn your hard-earned cash into trash. So what exactly should you do? Economic experts are suggesting you invest in alternative assets. One that's been getting a lot of attention lately is blue chip art. It's recently grown in volume 2,700%, beat the S&P 500 between 1995 and 2020, and it has outperformed every other asset during financial downturns. In fact, Contemporary art returned 23.2% during periods with more than 3% inflation. Now, a lot of people who are very wealthy have always hedged their portfolio with art. It's, it's actually a great way of hedging your portfolio. But you're kind of a normal person. You don't have millions of dollars lying around to buy a Banksy. Well, now here is the thing. 
There's a company, it's called masterworks.io. They've come up with a great idea. They're selling shares of million dollar paintings. So now you can invest in the same art billionaires use to safeguard their wealth with Masterworks. There's a number of great reasons to do so. They're the world's only $1 billion alternative investment platform. They've securitized over 80 paintings with the SEC. Everyday investors have already invested over $250 million. And many of them are Ben Shapiro Show listeners. So you will be joining your friends. I've partnered with Masterworks to get you VIP access, despite the fact I have a wait list that gives you priority access to their latest painting. To find out what it is, head on over to masterworks.io slash Ben. The offering sell out fast. You don't want to wait. That's masterworks.io slash Ben. Before deciding to invest, carefully review the important disclosures at masterworks.io slash disclaimer. Alrighty, so again, the progressives are holding up the infrastructure bill because they want more from the Build Back Better plan. Here's Bernie Sanders making that statement yesterday. It is amazing how the Bernie Sanders wing of the Democratic Party now has real influence. From day one, both of these bills are linked. Uh, I support the infrastructure bill, uh, but I want to see uh, a strong Build Back Better bill as well. And they're linked together. So what you don't want to see is the infrastructure bill passed and then not have uh, the kind of Build Back Better bill that we need. And that's why you need 50 members uh, on board before uh, there should be a vote, in my view, uh, in the House. Now, Politico is trying to spin this as a win for Biden somehow. What they're trying to spin as a win for Biden is the fact that Pramila Jayapal and the CPC put out a statement on the status of the Build Back Better negotiations in which they said that they overwhelmingly voted to endorse in principle the entire Build Back Better Act framework announced by Biden today. They say, we appreciate the president's leadership and his commitment to getting this process over the finish line. He reaffirmed, as our caucus has month after month, that both the infrastructure bill and the popular Build Back Better Act must move together because they are part of the same agenda. Today, we are reiterating our enthusiastic commitment to delivering that entire agenda to people across America. The reality is that while talks around the infrastructure bill lasted months in the Senate, there has only been serious discussion around the specifics of the larger Build Back Better Act in recent weeks. Thanks to the Progressive Caucus holding the line and putting both parts of the agenda back on the table. Now, Congress needs to finish the job and bring both bills to a vote together. This can't be accomplished without legislative text that can be fully assessed and agreed upon by all the parties. So Politico was trying to play this as a win for Biden because the CPC said that they agree with the framework. But agreeing with the framework don't mean squat. If they really agreed with the framework, they would have voted on the infrastructure plan yesterday, which they didn't. And Nancy Pelosi is super pissed about it. According to Politico earlier in the day, until they called the vote off Thursday evening, Pelosi and other top Democrats had been firm in their calls to vote. Projecting confidence, Pelosi teed up a House Rules Committee meeting on a bill text that will make up the base of the social spending bill. Cabinet members, outside advocates also pushed liberals to back the infrastructure bill before Biden landed in Rome. Pelosi said, quote, let's do it in timely fashion. Let's not just keep having postponements and leaving doubt as to when this would happen. Well, um, nope. So the progressives were like, guess what, Nancy? We don't work for you. She cannot control her caucus. Here's Cory Bush, the adjunct member of the squad from Missouri, saying, I'm not going to vote for Build Back Better. There are uh, home care workers that came to me in my district that cried because they were talking about nobody fights for us. Congresswoman, you are our congresswoman. Will you fight for us? I remember those faces right now. I will not turn my back on those home care workers. I won't turn my back on teachers and principals. I won't turn my back on on um, uh, anyone else in our community. We can't just look at one sect of our community. We have to look at the whole of it. And they deserve this. So, Cori Bush, I stand with my people. All of them. Okay. So, meanwhile, Representative Ilhan Omar, she's doing the same thing. She says both bills or none on infrastructure. We need to keep the promise that was made. We've been very clear. We need to see the two bills simultaneously move together. Yep. If there is urgency in getting this done, the senators need to understand that urgency as well and move as urgent as they want us to move so that we can get the two legislation done. Okay, so according to Punchbowl, which is another DC insidery publication, quote, there's no denying Thursday's episode was an embarrassing setback for Democrats, Biden included. Biden was supposed to help Pelosi bridge an ugly split between moderates and progressives. That didn't happen. In fact, it may be even worse. Strangely, when Biden met with House Democrats on Thursday, he didn't ask them to vote for the bipartisan infrastructure bill, which Pelosi was trying to get to the floor. Instead, the president urged rank and file lawmakers to to back both the infrastructure bill and the framework for the Build Back Better Act, which the White House unveiled early that morning. Pelosi had to jump up and say they should vote for the infrastructure bill first. Progressive noticed Biden's omission. They later argued that Biden had given them the green light to say no on infrastructure. So Joe Biden came in like the senile doddering fool that he is. 
And he completely undercut Nancy Pelosi. Pelosi's like, we want to give you the, the infrastructure win, and then they won't have any leverage on Build Back Better, and we can do exactly what you want, Mr. President. And Biden came in, and he's like, well, yeah, you should vote for Well, we made a promise. We're going to vote for both of them together. And the progressives are like, see, he, he's on our side. And Pelosi's like, I don't even know what to do anymore. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> According to Punchbowl, this wasn't just an oversight by Biden. The White House then adopted a deliberate hands-off approach to yesterday's scheduled vote, according to Democratic lawmakers. And then, apparently, there was a call between the White House Legislative Director of Legislative Affairs, Louisa Tyrell, National Economic Council Director Brian Deese, seen several senior White House officials and key Democratic lawmakers. Apparently, Tyrell was repeatedly asked to spell out their position on infrastructure. Representative Suzanne Delbean from Washington, chair of the New Democrat Coalition, asked straight out whether Biden wanted House Democrats to vote for the infrastructure bill. The White House officials then said they support both bills, which again, undercut Pelosi. We would have had a victory today if only he had asked for it, one Democratic aide said of Biden. So complete debacle. Politico tried to play it as a win. Punchbowl is actually being a lot more honest. But it just once again demonstrates that this administration does not know what the hell it is doing. And they have no leverage over the progressive members of their coalition. I think, honestly, I think that when it comes right down to it, I'm not sure that Biden even wants to pass the damn thing. I think Biden says he wants to pass the thing, and then he wants to run in 2024 on Republican obstructionism. The problem is he's got a Democratic caucus. It makes it so difficult for him. In some ways, the worst thing that has happened to Biden is the fact that Republicans blew both of those Georgia Senate races, because now there's been an actual ask made of Democrats. If Mitch McConnell were running the Senate, we all know this would be DOA. But because it's Manchin and Cinema, it's put Biden in a box of his own making, because he is not pursuing anything remotely like a moderate policy. And they're making clear, Biden is, that so much of this is, is performative. The way that he is marketing Build Back Better is not as a moderate attempt to shore up holes in the social safety net. He's, he's pushing it as a transformative plan that is going to radically redefine how economics is done in the United States. And so maybe his goal is that nothing passes because then he can say that he was trying to be transformative and everybody else failed him. Because just like Barack Obama, the president can never fail. You can only fail the president. We'll get to more of this in just one second. First, let's talk about a simple fact. Right now is a great time to refi your house. And you better do it fast because the Fed is going to begin tapering. The mortgage rates are going to go up next year. Now is a really, really good time to refi your mortgage. You might be thinking, why? Your mortgage is fine. Well, what you should be asking is how your mortgage could work for you. And that answer can be found at American Financing, America's home for home loans. They don't pressure you. Instead, their salary-based mortgage consultants get to know you so they can lead you to greater overall savings. It could be a shorter loan term or consolidating debt because there's more to refinance than just a lower rate. It's the reason why they save customers up to 1000 bucks a month. So why not see what they can do for you? Make the 10-minute call right now before those rates are gone. 866-721-3300. That's 866-721-3300. Or visit AmericanFinancing.net, NMLS 182-334, NMLSConsumerAccess.org. Again, your biggest monthly bill is undoubtedly your mortgage. If you can lower that, why would you not even like make the call? Just give American Financing a call right now at 866-721-3300. That's 866-721-3300. Or visit AmericanFinancing.net. That's AmericanFinancing.net. All righty, so Joe Biden, again, he is pitching this entire thing as a transformative policy. Americans are not interested in your stupid transformative nonsense at a moment when the economy should be booming but is not thanks to your policy failures. Now, it is amazing how the media are reporting that last quarter's economic downturn was largely due to Delta, not to the policies of the Biden administration and blue state governors. We know that's not true because here in Florida, where we have a red state governor and we are not paying attention to anything that Joe Biden has to say, the economy is booming. Once again, I repeat, it is the single most important economic statistic because if the states are laboratories of democracy, then their policies ought to show some differences. If you look at the unemployment rate by state in the United States right now, I'm looking at the Bureau of Labor Statistics for September. Okay, here are the best states in terms of employment. Here's the list. Again, I'll do it again, okay? Utah, okay, Nebraska's number one, red. Utah, red. Idaho, red. New Hampshire, purple. South Dakota, red. Vermont, purple. Well, Vermont's kind of blue. Oklahoma, red. Alabama, red. Georgia, red. Montana, red. North Dakota, red. Minnesota, blue. Missouri, red. Virginia, now turning purple. Kansas, red. Wisconsin, purple. Arkansas, red. Indiana, red. Iowa, red. South Carolina, North Carolina, red, red. Kentucky, red. Tennessee, red. Wyoming, red. Okay, are you noticing a pattern here? These are all the best states in terms of unemployment. Now, let's go to the bottom of the list. 
Okay, here are the worst states in terms of unemployment right now. Nevada, blue. California, blue. New York, blue. New Jersey, blue. New Mexico, blue. Illinois, blue. Connecticut, blue. Hawaii, blue. D.C., blue. Okay, you noticing a pattern at all here? Okay, so if this is supposedly just about Delta, why this heavy striation thanks to obvious political consideration? Especially because Delta, this wave, hit the red states. Okay, so if the idea is that Delta is what hurt the economy, you would expect a massive jump in unemployment in southern red states. But some of the states that I just read to you are not southern. I mean, are, are not, uh, are, are some of the states that, the, most of the states that have high unemployment rates are not southern and had no Delta spike. And a lot of the states that I read to you at the very beginning are southern and had serious Delta spikes. Right In that list of states that I was reading to you was the state of Tennessee, major Delta spike. Was the state of Georgia, serious Delta spike. So what exactly is the deal, guys? It looks more like this has less to do with Delta than it has to do with political policy. The Democrats have to keep play- claiming, and the media have to repeat it, that the real economic downturn is not Democratic policy when we all know that it is. And they have to keep claiming that so that we will pretend that Joe Biden's massive spending plan isn't going to be just as damaging as the rest of his garbage agenda. So what exactly is in this budget framework? According to the Wall Street Journal editorial board, the blueprint the White House released is more frame than work. The jury-rigged plan is an enormous expansion of government with quarter-baked entitlement programs that will retard work and $1.58 trillion in tax increases that will distort and limit investment. The $1.75 trillion cost the Democrats have assigned is a lie. They use phony accounting to finance a few years of new spending with 10 years of tax increases. For example, the plan extends the $3,600 child tax credit for one year at a cost of $110 billion. But Democrats are going to extend it next year. If it's extended for 10 years, that would be $1.1 trillion, not $110 billion. So literally, they are saying that the cost of a program they are extending is $110 billion. The actual cost over 10 years, if it were extended as they hope to do, is $1.1 trillion. So it's a false sunset. The agreement drops the House's proposed Medicare vision and dental expansion, but preserves a new hearing benefit, which the White House claims will cost a mere $34 billion and start in 2024. The annual cost of the hearing benefit, once fully phased in, is $16 billion. Congress will make it permanent. True cost, $160 billion. And this sort of stuff is true throughout the bill. The real cost is likely closer to $4 trillion than $1.75 trillion. Meanwhile, the plan is to ratchet up taxes in a wide variety of ways. They're trying to claim $400 billion in revenues from $80 billion in, quote, IRS investments, a 66% budget increase for the IRS, including hiring more auditors. Does this sound like fun to you? You really want more auditors looking down your neck? Is that really what, like, breathing on your neck? That, that's what you want. More IRS? Who in the United States was like, you know what we need more of? IRS auditors. Huge. We need more people at the IRS. Americans hate the IRS, and for good reason. By the way, it's a lie that this is going to claim $400 billion in revenue. The CBO says this is only going to yield $200 billion in revenue. And because we're spending $80 billion on the IRS to build them new toilets, it's actually only going to net about $120 billion to the federal government. Also, the $1.85 trillion in tax increases includes a 15% minimum tax on book income of large corporations. But we all know what's going to happen here. Democrats are then going to create carve-outs for all their friends. Corporations are going to be taxed on stock buybacks. So corporations will just shift the way that they pay people from stock buybacks to share dividends. Despite its anti-corporate advertising, the bill is a giant boondoggle for, it's, it's basically Solyndra. They're, they're dedicating $555 billion for climate spending, investing in renewables, nuclear, hydrogen, carbon capture, electric vehicles, batteries, and transmission lines. That's on top of the tens of billions in green energy handouts in the Senate infrastructure bill. Okay, that's, how much of that is going to be efficient spending? The answer is very little. The truth is that the government invests in a lot of projects. You never see the benefits of the vast majority of them. And very often it's corrupt. We know this because one Barack Obama tried to do the exact same thing. You remember those green jobs that were supposed to materialize? And it turns out it was all just a lie. Also, we are going to see massive tax increases, a 5% surtax on income over 10 million bucks, 8% over $25 million. Those surtaxes raise the top marginal personal income tax rate to 45% or so. And in New York and California, where you have state tax on top of that, the people at the top of the tax brackets are going to be paying 60% in New York and California. How many billionaires do you think are going to stick around in New York and California for that? See, it doesn't make a difference to them if the marginal tax increase between like New York and Florida is not all that great. 
But if you're talking about the difference between paying, say, a 45% tax rate and a 60% tax rate, get ready, red states, for a lot of income because everybody's going to be moving on down to Texas and Florida, which is the reason that Nancy Pelosi and company wanted to restore the SALT deduction. Right? They, they wanted to make sure that you paid your state income tax first so that they could essentially give a subsidy to the blue states. So the bill is a full-scale disaster, and it's, it's filled, again, with this notion that there is a great urgency to do all of this. And I'm sorry, but there isn't a great urgency to do all of this, particularly the $500 billion on climate change nonsense. I mean, that, that, that's the single biggest part of the bill is $500 billion, $555 billion to fight climate change, largely through tax incentives for low emission sources of energy. Okay, well, here is the thing. Those tax incentives for low emission sources of energy are not going to marginally, uh, they're really not going to any, in any real way lower the carbon emissions. Hey, people putting solar on their house is not going to make the, the rate of global warming decrease in any serious material way over the course of the next 100 years. What you need is actual innovation. And innovation is generally derived from making things marketable and not from simply throwing money at the problem. They're not even dedicating that $555 billion to, to the kind of infrastructure change that would be necessary to cope with rising climate. Now, you'll remember that last year, well, this year, actually, there was this big hurricane it, it swept through the South. Remember, it was very similar to, to Hurricane Katrina. It didn't do nearly as much damage. Why? Because they'd short up the infrastructure in New Orleans. We should be spending money on that kind of stuff. Like why the Northeast got completely flooded. One of the reasons it got completely flooded is because the infrastructure there is not so good. But the progressives are like, we're not going to build that infrastructure. Instead, we are going to need $555 billion to pay the schmuck down the street to get a Tesla. Okay, but by the way, that is not a poor people thing. Teslas are very expensive. Subsidizing electric cars are not something that impoverished people in this country are deeply worried about right now. So this is one thing that the, the wild left is very enthusiastic about. And they have to try and scare you into believing that we need to spend this kind of money. So you have the irrepressible, irredeemable AOC, so fresh, so face, faceness and freshness abounding, saying that entire regions of the United States are going to be unlivable unless she can put her hand in your wallet, take out all of your money and then hand it to a bunch of people who vote Democrat. By 2028, crop yields are, be, are already projected to begin to fail, with famine beginning to hit the world's most vulnerable populations. By 2038, current U.S. drought, fire, and extreme heat trends make, will, could potentially make whole regions of the United States unlivable if we continue the trends that lobbyists are trying to, to pers have us pursue. Oh, who actually believes this? Really, first of all, there are already regions of the United States where people don't live. Okay, there are broad swaths of the West where people just don't live. Okay, and people will move. People will adapt, as they have literally throughout human history. Remember, there used to be an actual land bridge between Asia and the United States and, uh, and, and North America. It doesn't exist anymore. There's, a, there's a, a sea over it. Climate change has been a perennial of human existence. People have adapted to it. I, I am, I guess, optimistic because now she's extended her timeline for doom to 2038. You'll recall that a couple of years ago, she said we had 12 years where the earth was going to completely eat us. It's just going to open up like the, like the book of, of numbers and just swallow us whole. Meanwhile, I have Ayanna Presley saying this is a climate justice bill. I, I, this is not what the word justice means, guys. I mean, I, like the word justice has a meaning. And when you just add some other word in front of it to mean a thing that I like, it doesn't mean anything anymore. Here's Ayanna Presley pushing this. One climate scientist said, quote, what we do in the next 10 years will matter for 10,000 years, unquote. I believe that what we do in the next 10 days on infrastructure investments will be the true predictor of our planet's future. The Build Back Better Act is a climate justice bill and a workers justice bill. We can and we must act with urgency. Thank you. And I yield back. Climate and workers justice and everything justice. And uh, it's so tiresome. It's so tiresome. It all is linked together with the progressive agenda to call everything white supremacy. So Cori Bush yesterday, she started berating oil executives uh, by calling them white supremacists because they drill for oil or something. I, I don't even understand what she's talking about now. For years, you all have continued to promote fossil fuels despite knowing that promoting them means promoting environmental racism and violence in black and brown communities. You all are still promoting and selling fossil fuels that are killing millions of people. This is a striking example of white supremacy. Your profit-driven choices threaten my life, 
the lives of my family, my neighbors, and our communities every single day. Um, I'm sorry, oil threatens black communities every single day? Truly? You know, it seems kind of like white supremacy to me, frankly. A bunch of upper crust white liberals in the main who are telling a bunch of countries, largely people of color, that they cannot have economic development because we are deeply concerned that over the course of the next hundred years, they might have to move their beach houses in the United States. That seems a lot more like white supremacy than people drilling for oil so that people can live in not abject poverty. Uh, honestly, carbon-based fuels were one of the great discoveries of mankind. And thank God, we are now developing alternative sources of energy. People are buying Tesla. Like, it is good that people are buying Teslas. I'm very much in favor of it. I'm glad that we're doing fracking because natural gas is much more is much more environmentally friendly than than oil and coal, right? Like all of that's true. But the notion that oil executives are, are in, complicit in white supremacy, again, it is all just ball everything up in one ball and we need to redo how the world works. In one second, we're gonna get to the democratic perspective on redoing how the world works because this is really what it comes down to. They want every single human in the United States to be dependent on the government. They think that this is a fulfilling life. Fulfillment lies in you being dependent on the government playing husband and father to you. We'll get to more of this in just one second. First, you know those gas prices that I was talking about a moment ago? You know, the gas prices are, are truly spiking. They're out of control. If you are in California, in some place you're paying like seven bucks a gallon. You need get upside. My listeners are making up to 25 cents for every gallon of gas every time they fill up. Just download that free get upside app in the App Store or Google Play right now. Use promo code Shapiro. Get a bonus 25 cents per gallon on your first fill up. That's up to 50 cents cash back. Don't pay full price at the pump anymore. Get cash back using GetUpside. Just download the app for free. Use promo code Shapiro to get up to 50 cents per gallon cash back on your first tank. Some people who drive a lot are making as much as two to 300 bucks a month in cash back. There's no cash. The cash gets added right back to your account. You can cash out anytime to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon and other brands. Just download the free GetUpside app. Use promo code Shapiro. You can get up to 50 cents per gallon cash back on your first tank. That is code Shapiro. Go check them out right now. Again, get the free GetUpside app right now and use promo code Shapiro. You get up to 50 cents per gallon cash back on your very first tank of gas. Now is an excellent time for you to be saving money on gas. Get Upside. Go check it out right now. We'll get to more in just one second. First, it is that glorious time of the week when I give a shout out to a Daily Wire member today. It's Summer Lillenberg on Instagram who understands the importance of proper parenting. In the pic, Summer is happily sitting with her two adorable children while holding the world's greatest beverage vessel. The caption reads, just trying to raise the next generation right with my hashtag leftist here's Tumblr. Now that's some excellent momming right there. Keep up the good work and never ever allow your children within the purview of the Loudoun County School Board. Thanks for the pic and for being a Daily Wire member. Also, let me remind you that one of the things that we here at Daily Wire are very big on is fighting back against the leftist culture, okay? And the leftist culture is costing people their jobs, which is why we are very proud to bring on board Allison Williams, seasoned sports reporter from ESPN. You remember, she announced her resignation last week from ESPN because essentially they forced her out the door. She didn't want to get vaccinated because she already had natural immunity and she was looking to get pregnant and she had questions. And ESPN was like, well, there's the door. Well, now she works here, which we are super excited about because the fact is that quality people are being forced out and we are going to pick them up and we are going to give you excellent content. Frankly, we're excited that the leftists have decided to throw all their talented people out the door because they refuse to abide by leftist diktats. So if you want to help us do this, provide a place for people to land and give you great content, you need to help us out at dailywire.com slash subscribe. Use code do not comply at checkout for 25% off. We're building a movement against the leftist Hollywood machine and Joe Biden's unconstitutional mandate. We do need your help. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe. Code do not comply for 25% off and join the fight. Also, reminder, you need to listen to Morning Wire. Morning Wire is great. Not only has it been topping the Apple and Spotify charts since its release, it's the only daily podcast that values your time and the truth. It's 15 minutes or less, all the news you need to know. Subscribe, start listening now to Morning Wire on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave a five-star review if you like what you hear. You're listening to the largest, fastest-growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. All righty, so... Again, the Democrats are trying to force through the notion that this is everything that they are doing is, is required because if not, the world will burn. And this is why they're focusing in on climate change. Everything is a crisis because whenever you can declare a crisis, this means that you can take absolute control. So over the last year and a half, we had an actual crisis in the form of a global pandemic that's killed millions of people. But nobody, I mean, but nobody actually thinks that climate change over the course of the next century is a crisis. It may be a problem. It might be a serious problem that we need to deal with. No one thinks it's a crisis that requires us to dump out trillions of dollars from a piggy bank that does not exist into an economy that's already overheated. Nobody thinks that. But 
Democrats have to ratchet up the rhetoric. So you get a piece like this from the New York Times today. When the world is on the brink, $3.5 trillion is a pittance, a pittance by Abram Lustgarten, environmental reporter for for ProPublica, wild left organization. There will be no bargains with an overheating climate. The $3.5 trillion price tag that President Biden proposed for his climate-heavy Build Back Better Act might seem enormous, but over the long term, it will be a pittance. What we don't spend now will cost us much more later. The bills for natural disasters and droughts and power outages are already pouring in. Within a few decades, the total bill will be astronomical as energy debts surge, global migration swells, industrial upheaval follows, the scale of the threat demands a new way of thinking about spending. Past budgets can no longer guide how governments spend money In the future, some economists and climate scientists have calculated climate change could cost the United States the equivalent of nearly nearly 4% of its gross domestic product a year by 2100. 4% is likely a conservative estimate. That comes out to about $840 billion per year, 4% of the American GDP, it figured on last year's economy. Okay, well, um, let's say that that's true. 4% of the American GDP, that's $840 billion per year. I noticed that you guys are attempting to spend like a multiple of that. I noticed that, that we are going to have a $4 trillion budget, that we are going to have dumped out $1.9 trillion earlier this year, that we spent $7 trillion last year. I've noticed that, um, and, and so your notion is we should spend much more money than it's going to cost us? Uh, again, the, all of this neglects the fact that there is going to be future economic growth. And if you crimp the plan, right, if, if you crimp economic growth with regulation and taxation, then what you end up doing is lowering the growth curve. So if you say 4% of annual GDP, you have to estimate how much that annual GDP is going to be. If the original curve is going to be high and now you've lowered the curve, okay, that curve lowering itself is a major cost. This is something that Bjorn Lomberg is constantly pointing out over at the Wall Street Journal. He says, adaptation doesn't make the cost of global warming go away entirely, but it does reduce it dramatically. Higher temperatures will will shrink harvest if farmers keep growing the same crop, but they're likely to adapt. Corn production in North America has shifted away from the Southeast and toward the upper Midwest. When sea levels rise, governments build defenses like levees, flood walls, and drainage systems that protected New Orleans from much of Hurricane Ida's ferocity this year. Nonetheless, many in the media push unrealistic projections of climate catastrophes while ignoring adaptation. This is correct, of course. You can see how far from reality these sorts of projections are in one heavily cited study depicted in a, in a graph. If you assume no society will adapt to any sea level rise between now and 2100, you'll find that vast areas of the world will be routinely flooded, causing $55 trillion in damage annually in 2100, or about 5% of global GDP. But as the study emphasizes, in reality, societies are likely to adapt. By raising the height of dikes, the study shows humanity can negate almost all of that. Only 15,000 people would be flooded every year which is a remarkable improvement compared with the 3.4 million people flooded in 2000. The total cost of damage, investments in new dikes, and maintenance costs of existing dikes will fall sixfold between now and 2100 to 0.008% of world GDP. So in other words, you can do something about climate change, but it does not require this garbage. So what is this really about? What this is really about is making people dependent on the government. So the White House put forward another one of these absurd, I mean, it's just absurd, slideshows. Now, you remember back in 2012, Barack Obama was pushing very hard on spending on social policy, and he put out something called The Life of Julia. And The Life of Julia was roundly mocked because it showed Julia as this woman who was utterly dependent on government her entire life. And it was openly mocked. It was mocked on late night TV. It was was mocked by everybody on the right. Most people in the center thought it was stupid. Now the Biden administration is bringing it back. Like, I don't know who there was like, Life of Julia was great. Now we need a sequel, Life of Linda. So this is what they did. They put together something called Life of Linda. And I got to tell you, Linda leads a pretty sad life. Linda's life, according to this, is really pathetic. Number one, Linda is is pregnant and there's no father anywhere in the picture. Uh, Always, always and forever. The government is dad. The government is dad. This is the goal, right? Welfare policy, it's a substitute for father. Okay, so here is the life of Linda as presented by the Biden White House, right? You're supposed to be optimistic about this and excited about this. This is what you can hope for from life. Linda is a working mother in Peoria, Illinois. She works at a local manufacturing facility as a production worker and earns $40,000 per year. She is pregnant with her son, Leo. Okay, so this is, uh, I I love how they have to just violate all, stop the gender stereotyping. She's a production worker with a hard hat in the, she's not a teacher or something, right? Okay, so we'll start with that. There, of course, there are women in manufacturing. I'm just saying that heavy manufacturing is, is stereotypically a male industry and they know that, which is why they did this. 
And once Leo is born, father nowhere in the picture, by the way, Linda begins receiving child tax credits of $300 per month, $3,600 annually to help cover essential costs like groceries, rent, and medicine. I have a question. Uh, how much is that going to help if the inflation outpaces the child tax credit? Also, if she does not have to work in order to receive the child tax credit, how is that going to impact the hours that she takes on at the manufacturing facility? Is she just going to stay out of the workforce considering there are a bevy of other benefits available to Linda? But don't worry, the government will step in regardless. As Leo grows up, says the White House, the government helps cover the cost for his daycare, guaranteeing that Linda doesn't need to pay more than 7% of her income on childcare. Well, that's exciting. So we are going to also make sure that Leo can grow up in a government facility. Right? Because again, Linda's not married. So there are no options for Linda to stay home with the, with the kid. So that's great. When Leo turns three, he attends a high-quality pre-K program for free. Um, I have my doubts. I have my doubts. We were told that the public schools were going to be a high-quality program for free. Nope! America's public schools are a giant fail. The only public schools that are good are the ones that are locally driven by excellent parents. That, that's, that's the big defining factor. Pre-K, universal pre-K, has been a giant fail. Hey, the, the, the Head Start program, which this is modeled on, has poor outcomes. And they're pretty clear about this being modeled on Head Start. The Head Start program, according to the Heritage Foundation, was launched in 1965, enrolling 560,000 kids in the new federally funded eight-week summer program. At the time, proponents were clear that Head Start's sole purpose was to prepare children for elementary school. Unfortunately, more than half a century later, it sucks. The Department of Health and Human Services, which administers Head Start, revealed in December 2012 that the nearly $8 billion Head Start program has little to no impact on the cognitive, social, emotional, or health outcomes of participants or the parenting skills of the parents. In fact, participation in Head Start actually had some negative effects on enrolled children. Federal researchers reported worse peer relations and lower teacher-assessed math ability for Head Start kids. So more cowbell, always more cowbell. Also, the Government Accountability Office found several Head Start centers around the country actively counseling families to underreport their incomes in order to appear eligible for the services. So they were facilitating fraud. Among the 175 Head Start centers inspected by the Inspector General, none fully complied with federal Head Start or state requirements to protect children from, uh, from unsafe materials and equipment. 21 of 24 grantees did not fully comply with federal Head Start or state requirements to conduct criminal records checks, conduct recurring background checks, document criminal records checks, conduct checks of child care exclusion lists, or conduct checks of child abuse and neglect registries. And we keep spending money on it. So they're like, what if we do that? Okay, so back to the White House plan here. So you've got the little kid going through the full-scale government program all the way through. And it doesn't end there. There's more benefits, cradle to grave. They're not hiding the ball. It's all cradle to grave stuff from this administration, of course, because this is the goal. The end goal is to reorient how Americans interact with the government. This is Joe Biden's plan. Is anybody up for this? You wonder why Glenn Youngkin is winning in Virginia might have something to do with this. Okay, so back to Leo's story. So here's what we know about Leo. Born to a single mom, because daddy is nowhere in the picture. He's been in government schooling since he was three. When Leo leaves high school, he's able to enroll in, communi uh, in a community college thanks to extended Pell Grants and investments in community college. So apparently Leo is, uh, is, is not one of the bright eggs. So he goes to the community college and requires a Pell Grant in order to do so. And then this is my favorite part of the whole presentation. Thanks to community college, Leo lands a good paying union job as a wind turbine technician. Oh, will he? Is that going to be a rich industry? Wind turbine technician. Honest to God, I don't know. How many, how many wind turbine technicians are there? How many people work in the wind industry in the United States? Apparently, there are currently 85,000 Americans currently employed in the wind power industry and related fields. 85,000. There are 330 million people, but apparently we're all going to be working at wind, at wind farms. That's what we're going to be doing. And a union job, right? It's going to be a union job. It's going to be an expensive boondog. So he's going to be working for the government effectively because if you're working on a wind turbine farm, there's a very good shot that that is a government subsidized job. Leo's job is one of 4 million new jobs a year supported by President Biden's economic plan, right? So that there it is. So Joe Biden is going to, quote unquote, create jobs by subsidizing, give away goodies to union buddies. And Leo's going to work for one of those people. Later in life, Linda needs home care and hearing care. Thanks to President Biden's plan, Linda can access affordable hearing care through Medicare, and Leo is able to afford at-home elder care for his mom. Okay, so that's, again, very exciting stuff. So the government is going to pay for Linda 
to get hearing care because apparently no elderly people in the United States have hearing care. That's a new one to me because my grandmother does. Actually, both grandmothers do outside of Medicare. And, um, and also, apparently, Leo was going to leave mom to rot. But now that, now that he's got this subsidy to a union home health care worker, he's going to pay for all that. So again, this is, this is the ideal life, according to the Democrats. At no point is there any upward trajectory or upward mobility. You basically just stagnate in your lower middle class life, working as a wind turbine technician on a government subsidy, going to community college. Like, what, what an enriching and wonderful life that sounds like. Isn't that, isn't that great? What an enriching, wonderful, exciting life for the life of Linda. Again, these are, these are very humble. I, I would say these are pretty humble aspirations for both Leo and Linda. They also don't have the slide where, where Leo, having been brought up in a government facility all of his life, goes out in the streets and starts burning down government buildings because he's very upset that the United States is systemically racist and unjust. That part they didn't, they didn't tell you about because that part's a little awkward. But right, it, was, it was right before he went to community college and also before he got the wind turbine job, Leo. Got to love the fictional stories. He, in, in the original American vision, the American dream was, Linda works hard. She works a job and she works difficult and long hours, but she also takes care of her kid and she's married, so her husband is around to help. And they together invest enormous time and effort in their son, Leo. Leo goes on to create a new good product or service. And he then proceeds to start a business where he hires lots of other people. He becomes inordinately wealthy having made the country that much better off through his own innovative skill and risk-taking, right? That used to be the American dream. If you were to tell the Horatio Alger story of the American dream, that was the American dream. And that's true for so many Americans because the fact is the vast majority of people who start at the bottom of the American income spectrum do not end up at the bottom of the American income spectrum. People tend to rise over the course of their life. This is why older people are richer than younger people in the United States. Okay, but that's not the story the Democrats wish to tell. They wish to tell you the story about a lower income, lower middle income person, middle income person, who stays a lower middle income person and lives their life completely dependent on government largesse. If that sounds like an inspiring life story to you, I, I don't know what to tell you. You should be hoping for more. You should be aspiring for more. It's, um, it, it, it is just amazing to me that this is what the Biden administration seems to want to push. That this is the life that they seem to want you to have. So, so wonderful, so wonderful. Meanwhile, as they impoverish you, and as they tell you that we are going to have to lower our economic estimates because of climate justice and environmental justice and white supremacy and all the rest of the silly progressive buzzwords, as they tell you that the best you can hope for is to one day work at a wind turbine factory with a government unionized job, as they do that, they are given lottery tickets to uh, illegal immigrant families. That's exciting stuff. According to the Wall Street Journal, the United States is currently in talks to pay hundreds of millions of dollars to families separated at the border. Okay, uh, again, this is kind of incredible. And so, so Americans are experiencing wild, out-of-control inflation. There are 10 million open jobs and people aren't getting back in the workforce. We have supply chain bottlenecks. Joe Biden is pledging to basically lower his economic growth estimates to below 2% a year for the rest of time. But we have enough money in the bank to be paying, I kid you not, $450,000 per person in compensation to immigrant families separated by the Trump administration. There are several agencies working to resolve lawsuits filed on behalf of parents and children who say the government subjected them to lasting psychological trauma. The U.S. Departments of Justice, Homeland Security, and Health and Human Services are considering payments that could amount to close to $1 million a family. Though the final numbers could shift, people familiar with the matter said. Most of the families that crossed the border illegally from Mexico to seek asylum in the United States included one parent and one child, the person said. Many families would likely get smaller payments depending on their circumstances. The ACLU has identified about 5,500 kids separated at the border over the course of the Trump administration, citing figures provided to it by the government. The number of families eligible under the potential settlement is expected to be smaller. About 940 claims have so far been filed by the families. The potential payout could be a billion bucks or more. So remember, there is a zero tolerance enforcement policy in which the United States would not just release illegal immigrants into the interior of the United States after giving them a piece of paper saying, come back in a month. The, the Trump administration said, we're not doing that. If you come, you will be held until you actually have your asylum date, until we find out whether you are here or whether, whether you're here for good reason or whether you're just trying to cross the border illegally. Now, there was something called the Flores Settlement. The Flores Settlement said that kids could not be held with their parents in confinement. So instead, kids were separated from parents. Very often they were handing to, handed to a relative. Sometimes they'd be put in a holding facility for a little while. 
right? But that was because of the Flores settlement. It was defined by law. The two choices were release the entire family unit into the interior or two, don't. And you have to separate the kids from the parents by law because of the stupid Flores settlement. So that's what the Trump administration did. Now, if you were one of the illegal immigrants who came with your kid and your kid was separated from you, the government is going to sign you a $450,000 check per person. So for your kid and for you. So not only did you get to enter the United States illegally, you also get a giant check from the U.S. government signed by the taxpayer. Isn't that exciting stuff from the Biden administration? The lawsuits allege some of the children suffered from a range of ailments, including heat exhaustion and malnutrition, were kept in freezing cold rooms and provided little medical attention. That is indeed terrible. You know what else is a really bad idea? Paying people for the separation of the family required by law when they cross the border. You want to incentivize illegal immigration? Don't just say, come on over here and we got a bunch of free welfare benefits and we're not going to kick you out. Say, if we happen to separate you because we have to by law, we will sign you a million dollar check. That's crazy towns. In recent months, lawyers for the families and government have told courts overseeing the cases they are engaged in settlement negotiations. Legal Learned, deputy director of the ACLU, says, quote, President Biden has agreed that the family separation policy is a historic moral stain on our nation that must be fully remedied. That remedy must include not only meaningful monetary compensation, but a pathway to remain in the country. So again, remember that they are not only pushing for a giant check, they're also pushing for people to just get to stay here. In his first weeks in office, Biden pledged to reunite the separated families. By the way, not all the families have been reunited, even still. Senator Tom Cotton said the Biden administration's promises of citizenship and entitlement programs have already caused the worst border crisis in history. A huge cash reward will make it even worse. Some government lawyers view the payouts as excessive for people who had violated the law by crossing the border. One government lawyer threatened to remove his name from the case out of disagreement with the potential settlement offer. In another instance, a Department of Homeland Security attorney involved in the settlement talks complained on a conference call that payouts could amount to more than some families of 9-11 victims received. So if that's the case, I mean, think about the insane moral logic of that. You cross the border illegally with your kid because you're attempting to get into the country illegally. You're separated. The government says, here's a million dollar check and you get to stay in the country. Now, you're a family member of somebody who got vaporized on 9-11 by a terror attack on the World Trade Center. You get a lower check than the illegal immigrant who just crossed the border for pain and suffering. That's unbelievable. Trying to take the cases to trial would be unpredictable, with juries potentially awarding larger sums to the family, said legal experts. Damage class actions in this kind of case are pretty rare. It's hard to think of a recent comparison, said Margot Schlanger, who ran the civil rights office during the Obama administration. It's a complicated, complex piece of litigation to try to resolve hundreds of different lawsuits at the same time, sometimes even more complex to try the cases. Many of the families filed tort claims, a type of civil claim seeking damages for loss or harm. Some of the cases were resolved under the Trump administration. In a 2019 settlement in New Jersey, for example, an adult and a minor received a total of $125,000. Many of those cases were still pending at the start of the Biden administration. But again, the fact that this administration is now considering a widespread policy of just giving money to people for this sort of thing, like pretty insane, making illegal immigrant families rich, making American families poor. That is a hell of an, and making everybody dependent, illegal, non-illegal, everybody dependent on the federal government. You wonder why the economic boom is stalling out? You wonder why a feeling of enervation has settled across the American population when it comes to work? This would be the reason. You have an entire side of the political aisle in the United States that basically now says that work is unnecessary. You shouldn't aspire to anything. The government will take care of you cradle to grave. If you don't want to vote for that, then vote for Glenn Youngkin if you're in Virginia. And if you don't like it, don't vote for Democrats across the country in 2022. I still think that most Americans have aspirations to live more than the life of Linda. If that's the case, then Democrats have a real cruising coming to them. Then Democrats have a real bruising coming to them in 2022. All righty, we've reached the end of today's show. However, we have another hour planned for you later. Plus, check out Andrew Clavin's show. That is every Friday. He's got an exciting evening planned for you. As always, head on over to dailywire.com, 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Central. Tune in. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Elliot Feld. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Production manager, Pavel Wydowski. Associate producer, Bradford Carrington. Host producer, Justin Barber. The show is edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Fabiola Cristina. Production assistant, Jessica Kranz. 
The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2021. Hey, everybody, this is Andrew Clavin, host of The Andrew Clavin Show. You know, some people are depressed because the republic is collapsing, the end of days is approaching, and the moon's turned to blood. But on The Andrew Clavin Show, that's where the fun just gets started. So come on over to The Andrew Clavin Show and laugh your way through the fall of the republic with me, Andrew Clavin. <laughs> 